All right. Um, uh, so, okay. Uh, so good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you here. Um, I'm going to be talking about product sense as it pertains to building great data products. Um, for a bit of background about myself, I guess you just went over it, but I'm a data scientist at Salesforce at present, and um, I work on this big data incubation team where we're trying to find all the ways in which to leverage the tons and tons of data that Salesforce has to sprinkle intelligence across the products in its various clouds. And prior to that, I worked on the search teams at LinkedIn and Microsoft, and I got my PhD before that. So I've had about um, seven years of experience building data products, and I wanted to share some of the insights I've had along the way. So I'm going to structure this talk in two parts. Um, in the first part, I'm going to talk about some of the common pitfalls that, um, that people often um, come across when building data products. And I'm going to structure this part of the talk as like a little episode of Mythbusters. And then um, in the next part of the talk, I'll delve a bit more into product sense. All right, so myth number one, data products are about displaying data. Um, and the canonical example of such a data product is Google Analytics. It's uh, the most widely used web analytics service on the internet. It gives you usage statistics for your website, who your visitors were, where they came from, and so forth. Um, and upwards of 50% of the most popular sites uh, on the internet today have used Google Analytics. So to many product managers and data scientists, um, this actually represents the canonical data product. They view data products as an opportunity to present data to users. So let's take this kind of thinking to an example that we use every day, Google Maps. Um, with all the live traffic information that we have streaming in from Android phones, this is really a, a great opportunity to give data back to the users. So how about this? As a user is driving and navigating a particular intersection, we show him a breakdown of how other people are navigating it at present. So we show him that 50% of the people are going straight, 40% are going left, and so forth. Or even better, we could show it as a pretty little gauge like this. But why stop at live traffic data? We have historical data. We could show the breakdown by weekend or weekday, or by month. We could pull in third-party data about the weather and show how people navigate this intersection when it's sunny versus when it's raining. And the user could have this entire dashboard at his fingertips to help him make decisions in real time on his daily commute, right? So thankfully, that's not what Google did. Instead, they built a navigation tool that allows you to specify a destination and then gives you turn-by-turn -turn directions till you reach there. And they use the live traffic data to, to detect congestion on highways and suggest alternative routes when available. So much more useful. Now, I'd like to believe that the dashboard example <clears throat> was so absurd that it would never actually happen in real life. But, but if you talk to many product managers and data scientists today, the dashboard metaphor is their, um, is, is their framework for thinking about data products. And so we have to be willing to step outside of the box to build products that actually provide tangible value to users. So this brings me to what I think a data product should be. It should be a product that, provides, that uses data to provide highly personalized value uh, experiences to users and tangible value, um, such as telling a person what his next action should be or helping him to make a decision. So myth number one, data products are about displaying data busted. Myth number two, users will behave as expected. So this is the LinkedIn profile of a colleague of mine. And if you look on the right-hand side, there's this little section called People Also Viewed. And the intuition behind this data product is that people tend to co-view the profiles of professionally similar people. So it's intended to surface the profiles of people who are similar to Ahmed. So, and, and, and indeed, if you look at these guys, they all are um, senior data scientists. They work at places like LinkedIn and Facebook and Salesforce. And, um, and it's, a, it's a very successful product, and recruiters use it very heavily to, to find candidates similar to people they already know. 
Um, so now let's look at the profile of Ashley Lynn Olson, who is a social impact manager at Alliance Residential Company. Who would we expect to see on the right-hand side for her? Will we see more social impact managers? Would we see people working at Alliance? Does anyone want to venture a guess? Sorry, what? <laughs> well, that's a good guess. Well, what we end up seeing is a territory account manager at EMC, a photography intern at the Green Bay Packers, and so forth. So what just happened here? <laughs> so people do tend to co-view the, the profiles of professionally similar people, but they also tend to click on pictures of pretty women. <laughs> And in fact, throughout this product, you'll see that there is a bias towards seeing pictures of pretty women on the right-hand side. Um, so what it means is that our expectation that users are going to be, uh, you know, going to browse the profiles of um, professionally simil similar people um, is not entirely true. And our models should have taken that into account. They should have included features such as the similarity of the titles of the uh, profiles or the places worked at and so forth. Users are not going to be good and well-behaved and do exactly what you expect them to. So myth number two, busted. Myth number three, optimize, optimize, optimize for clicks. And you know, who could argue with that? We have basically the greatest living data product, uh, Google, all search engines, recommendation systems, ad systems. Everyone optimizes for clicks. Well, does this look familiar to you? You know, click to find out which starlet these guys were fighting over. Or this baby girl's reaction to the worst present will restore your faith in mankind. Oops, how do I go back? Go back. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, so these, these are examples of clickbait, and um, face, at some point my Facebook news feed was brimming with them, um, and they're called clickbait because they try to reel you in with a very mysterious sounding headline, but then when you actually click on them, you're kind of disappointed. Um, if you optimize solely for clicks, you create an ecosystem for this kind of clickbait. And what Facebook then did to counter this problem was take into account the amount of time that people actually spend on the website to get a greater signal for usefulness, and this kind of clickbait just drastically reduced in my newsfeed. So that's the kind of thing you need to do. You need to be more nuanced about how you do your optimization. Um, so what are some of the things you could do? You could build mechanisms into your system that give you stronger signals of usefulness, like shares or upvotes. Or you could correctly model for the, and, and account for hidden costs, such as the cost of annoying your users with information that looks interesting but is not actually. And sometimes, even more importantly than the algorithms you're using, very simple things such as uh, choosing your data sources more wisely or allowing users to curate their own news feeds the way Twitter does can be so much more impactful than, you know, um, trying to get out the last little epsilon of um, tweak, tweaking your ranking algorithm to get a, you know, minute improvements. As the saying goes, if you optimize, um, if left unchecked, all optimization leads to gambling and porn. And so what this means is that if you optimize for clicks without regards for any kinds of nuances, you encourage the creation and promotion of this kind of content because this is what people tend to click on. Now, if you're BuzzFeed, this might be all right. But if you're not, this might actually hurt other metrics that you care about much more deeply, such as engagement, retention, repeat active users, and so forth. So optimize for clicks, busted. The next myth is um, closely related to the previous one, and it's that complex algorithms beat simple algorithms. Um, because we have all these amazing data products that have been built on top of sophisticated machine learning techniques, deep learning these days. And what is machine learning, if, uh, what is data science if it isn't machine learning and statistics and algorithms and so forth? So to illustrate my point here, I'm going to take an example from Salesforce, which has a service cloud that's essentially a customer service application that empowers um, co companies to manage all their customer information and service conversations in the cloud. So it allows um, service agents to create new cases, search a knowledge base of solutions, um, reach out to customers across different channels, and it consolidates all these multi-channel efforts within Salesforce. 
Um, one of the apps in the Service Cloud is called Social Studio. And what it allows is it allows services and marketing teams to monitor conversations about their brand across different social channels, such as Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and then it gives you a breakdown of all the tweets and status updates by topics and trends and sentiment. And then if there's ever a customer service issue that's tweeted about, uh, the service team can reach out to them um, and file a service case and all of this through Social Studio. So let's look at a customer service issue that was tweeted about by Eddie Russell. He just had the most awful experience uh, on KLM, and he, and he wrote to tell them this. Now, a super enthusiastic data scientist working at, in the service cloud might be tempted to say, let's automatically detect who Eddie Russell is, um, figure out what his booking code is, and then service this information to the service agent so that he's able to close the case much faster. That seems fair, right? So how do you go about building such a system? You might have a sentiment analysis component that's listening to a tweet stream and spits out all the negative tweets onto a queue. And then an entity resolution component that's listening to this queue and um, figuring out who the tweeter is to spit out a booking code for the service agent. And what could go into this entity resolution component? You might have a tweet processor that takes the tweet, spits out a name, handle, and a date. A gender classifier that looks for at mentions of this person, spits out whether he's male or female. A graph component that takes the Twitter handle, spits out his friends. And then you take this entire feature vector for this person, compare it across the travel manifest to find the most likely um, candidate, and give out the booking code. It's an awesome system, right? Well, this is what Caleb actually did. They just asked him for his booking code. <laughs> so much simpler. And actually, I think that was the right thing to do in this case. Because the problem with the automated approach is that the, the, the entity resolution could have been inaccurate. And uh, the person's Twitter handle could have been different from his actual name. And if you get it wrong, not only do you waste more time, but you make the company look even more incompetent than it already is. So just ask the user directly. It's less elegant, perhaps, but it's more simple. And much more importantly, it's more accurate. So myth number four, complex algorithms beat simple algorithms busted. So this, is more, this myth is more of a conclusion that one might be tempted to draw from the previous two myths, which is that users want to configure things for themselves. So give them more choice, um, you know, allow them to curate their own news feeds, uh, ask them for information about themselves, and so forth. Well, for this, I'd like to give the example of Google. When I search for Python in Google, this is what I see. I don't see this. Um, Google knows so many things about me that it's figured out um, from my past actions that it's basically become a mind reader. But at no point does it push any of this behind the scenes complexity to the end user. There's no options for me to like filter or sort. It doesn't ask me for explicit feedback on any of the search results. For 17 years, it's just been this single search box. And that's kind of the holy grail of where we want to reach. We want to be building data products that are very simple for people to use. So myth number five, also busted. So with that, I, I, I end my little episode of myth busters. But I wanted to emphasize that none of these myths are actually set in stone fallacies, right? So dashboards do serve their purpose. Optimizing for clicks is a great proxy in many cases. Um, but the point of all these examples was more to show that building data products is something of an art. And a very crucial component of that art is product sense. So what do I mean by product sense? Um, it's knowing what to build and why. So what tangible value does your product actually provide users? How does it um, affect company KPIs? And you can only really begin to answer these questions when you know your users, so you know what to expect of them, and you can anticipate their behaviors. <clears throat> and finally, having product sense means accepting that a user-first approach trumps a machine learning-first approach. As data scientists, we're often tempted to create all kinds of magic for our users, but a simple solution and a quick path to execution followed by rapid iteration is invariably the right thing to do. 
So how do you go about building product sense? Is it all just intuition? Um, well, first of all, it, um, you know, intuition isn't an all or nothing thing. You could have great intuition for building consumer web products, not so much for enterprise products. But more importantly, experience helps you build this intuition. So the best way to learn is by actually doing. Um, if, you, if you are a data scientist, don't be content to just come up with complex algorithms and toss them across the fence. Actively engage with product managers, designers, and users. Um, which brings me to my next important point, which is talk to your users to get a sense of the different personas that actually use your product and what the problem space could be. So LinkedIn, for instance, um, we conducted an extensive survey of recruiters uh, to find out how they use the search product. And we found out that their, their use of search is very different from regular users of search. Uh, they tend to, uh, regular users just search for keywords, whereas recruiters are more interested in finding people similar to people they've already hired. Um, so one of the things we built was this little similar, I don't know if you can see it, the similar search feature where when you click on similar over there, you can, it executes this, uh, a similarity search and gives you people who are similar um, to the person you're looking at. And this was something we figured out only after talking to recruiters. Um, and along the same veins for building greater empathy for users, eat your own dog food. Um, and once again, at LinkedIn, some designers and data scientists would really go out of their way to do this. Everyone gets a pro account for free when they join LinkedIn, but these guys would purposely refrain from upgrading so that they could have the experience of regular users. Um, which was distinctly different due to differences in the visibility into the LinkedIn graph. And then uh, uh, know your competitive landscape, of course. So you want to be building new products that are, that are different and offer something different to users. But knowing what worked for your competitors and what didn't can be extremely useful in input. And you don't want to be Nokia building yet another Nokia 7360 when everyone else is building smartphones. And finally, do what data scientists do best, be data-driven. Formulate hypotheses, validate with data before embarking on ambitious new projects. So at Microsoft, when I worked on the search team, we would begin every single planning session with a triage of our search queries uh, to see why, you know, what, were, what were the reasons for search failures. Um, so were there spelling mistakes? Were there not, uh, was, was the problem with um, the index not having? Um, some of the pages, was it a query understanding problem or a ranking problem? And the whole point of this was to be able to focus our efforts on how best to improve the search experience for the next quarter. So to summarize, learn by doing, talk to users, eat your own dog food, know the competitive landscape, and be data driven. And we all kind of know all of these things already, right? So it sounds kind of trite for me to say this, but it's so easy to forget these things as you go about your day-to-day -day jobs. So don't just pay lip service to these things. Stop to think about the actual value you're providing your users um, and whether you're really doing the simplest thing possible to test the waters um, as you go about building awesome new data products. That's it. Thanks.